retired in 1998. Uh, we moved to Vail, Colorado. Mm -hmm. Sold my company in 95, retired in 98. What was the company that uh, you ran? It was, uh, the holding company was called Junton and Inc. And we had five different companies underneath that. And they were all uh, involved with the technology space to, uh, we helped uh, acquire and manage human capital for emerging technology companies. Mm -hmm. So I retired in um, 98. We thought that was, you know, what we wanted to do. And my wife and I rode off into the sunset and became avid skiers and golfers and we were recreators. And, and no children at that no time? Children. No, in fact I was a desk pounding, I'm never going to be a dad guy. I mean I'd had a vasectomy when I was 30 and, um, and we, this was the path that I had charted. My goal was to retire at 40 and I ended up retiring at 43. Were you di disappointed? <laughs> no, not at all. And, well, for the first couple of years, retirement was great. And I'd wake up every morning just kind of pinching myself, saying, this is fabulous. And then along the way, um, this notion of there has to be more to life than just golfing and skiing abruptly introduced itself one day. And now, you, you uh, spent quite a few years prior to that as an athlete, Yeah, right? I grew up as a football player, and I had the good fortune to finish my athletic career as a quarterback in the Canadian Football League. So, so uh, where, where, where did your uh, early uh, years of football begin? Pop Warner? In the Bay Area, yeah. I played Pop Warner in the Bay Area, and then I went to, played high school football, and then I went to the University of Idaho on an athletic scholarship, and then migrated up and played in the Canadian Football League for a few years. I probably have the distinction of being one of the worst quarterbacks in the history of the Canadian Football League. So. Well, at least you were in the uh, in the pro ranks. Well, and you know, I was. it was great because it was a boyhood dream. And I really realized, I, I fulfilled that dream simply because I worked really hard. And I really tried. I mean, I made the most of somewhat of a average athletic ability to get into the place where I was able to play mm -hmm. and participate and you know and then ultimately I just kind of ran its course and they sent me on my way right. and then I, I went into business and I used a lot of the you know when you're a quarterback for 14 years and you grow up as a quarterback you inherently absorb some leadership characteristics right. mm -hmm. a great quarterback really understands how to move the chains. That's your job. Mm -hmm. Just keep getting first downs. Ultimately, you'll win the game if you keep getting first downs. And you learn those little incremental steps towards success. Right. And I was able to distill that down into some business principles with my company. And as we grew, I just kept moving the chains. And, mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, we were very successful. As, you know, We just looked up one day, and we had three offers for the company. And um, I, I took the best one and, and I thought that this was right on course, right on plan. We mm -hmm. were, uh, uh, and then this whole idea of there has to be something else out there. You know? And that's the reason why you're here in Traverse City. Uh, you're affiliated with the movie Stuck. Yes. Uh, well, and who was the director? Of Thaddeus Shield was mm -hmm. our director. Uh, Allison Emron was our editor. Jennifer Latham was our producer. How that all came about, it's a uh, fairly lengthy story, I'll make it sh as short as I can, mm -hmm. through this, you know, I was kind of questioning the honest measure of my worth through this whole retirement phase after a few years, and I ended up playing golf with an acquaintance who had uh, adopted two children from Haiti. I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but it is the truth that at the time I didn't know exactly where Haiti was. And um, But long story, I ended up going and visiting Haiti. We found an orphanage that was out of money. We adopted mm -hmm. three of those beautiful children. I was 51 years of age. I must say, I, I looked at a photo of your family photo. Right. Your, your children are absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, they, and they're, they have beautiful souls and mm -hmm. great potential. And so they came home, they were five, four, and nine months old. And um, so we started a foundation called Chances for Children to run that orphanage. And we really thought that that was going to be it. We were going to produce adoptions out of this one orphanage, support other children, and raise our kids. And that was a much more meaningful existence than, um, you know, just playing golf every day. And it was a much more meaningful existence. However, my golf buddies were so astounded by this that they said, you got to write a book about this. You, of all people. An orphanage? Three kids? At 51? So I wrote a book, which was just basically a lighthearted personal antidote. The book's called Both Ends Burning, um, which refers to, in this context, of me being overwhelmed as a rookie parent at 51 years of age. And um, I wrote the book in the middle of the night when the kids first came home. And through that labor, I, I kept saying to myself, if this gets one more kid adopted, then this effort was worth it. The book worked.
-hmm. people would read the book and say, well, hey, you know, we're inquiring, and if Craig could do it and really be enjoying it, mm -hmm. you know, we might want to add a child to our family through international adoption. And what I observed, and this is how uh, our other foundation started, was these good people with a sincere interest in adopting a child couldn't. They, there were all of these restrictions and barriers and, and discriminatory rules mm -hmm. that were turning good people with a sincere interest to adopt a child who was living in an orphanage away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I found that astounding and appalling and, and I went out on a two-year fact-finding mission. I did, I conducted a study, I hired M4 Strategies out of Costa Mesa to do the study. I went to the State Department, I went to UNICEF, I went to other countries. I really became fascinated with right. this dysfunctional mm -hmm. system that was damaging and destroying kids. Right. And um, after a few years of study and research, I said, well, you know, now I know too much and I, I'd like to do something about this. And so I started another foundation in the spirit of other social movements to create awareness and promote change, mm -hmm. similar to what Mothers Against Drunk Driving had done, similar to what um, uh, Nancy Brinker did with a Susan G. Komen, you know, just raise awareness, get enough people stomping your feet in unison, and then you can create real policy change. And in our context, we really want to defend the rights of a child to belong in a family. And, and the ultimate outcome is seeing more kids belong in a family just like our three kids. Because mm -hmm. every day, I see our three kids flourishing and growing and having breakthroughs. And I also know there's 10 million kids in orphanages all over the world that don't have that chance today. And that's wrong in my mind. So as we decided, uh, seven out of 10 Americans, one of our studies told us seven out of 10 Americans think inter country adoption is on the rise. They have no idea of this issue. And we thought our very first step was to create a sense of awareness. And so we decided to go out and make a film in the same context that Waiting for Superman did or Inconvenient Truth or The mm -hmm. Cove, mm -hmm. where we're exposing an issue and hopefully that, uh, uh, that, that exposing of the issue will put us in a position to promote solutions. And uh, so two years ago we went out and um, started filming. The mm -hmm. working title of the film was Wrongfully Detained, mm -hmm. which I still like, but uh, Stuck became a more apt title and probably a bit more of a marketable title. But the context of this Wrongfully Detained uh, element really uh, resonates with me because these children are, are really stuck in these orphanages simply because of the, the, the best interest of adults seem to tr are trumping the best interest of children right now. Stuck the documentary, it, it uh, follows the, the story of three different three families. families, right? Yeah, what we had at first is we had a fabulous news piece. We had a you know, Nightline or a 2020 piece, and we had really good content that was very compelling, but, you know, audiences seem to really connect to story and character, not content. And what we were able to do through the film is we ended up finding in um, th these three storylines that are really love stories. The primary story is uh, Nick and Lori Leroy trying to adopt Nate out of Vietnam takes him four years to bring Nate home. Nate's living in an ex-prison, literally, mm -hmm. um, with 20 other children and um, in just deplorable circumstances. Mm -hmm. And um, the two years into that adoption, the State Department sends them a letter and says this adoption is over. Mm -hmm. they were, and they were willing to fight for the child. So you, you really see the determination and the conviction and the love for these parents, for these children. And, and then at the, uh, at the end of the film, you see all three families that have evolved and grown, and it's, it's beautifully done. And uh, we, we screened it in D.C. in the Congressional Theater on Tuesday night for members of Congress and other dignitaries. And what kind of reaction? It was uh, aired on the... Uh, uh, Traverse City Film Festival stage on Thursday. Tuesday, or, or Friday on, morning. On Friday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, what type of reaction did the uh, audience have? Well, towards the, uh, I can quantify that by saying the Q&A was scheduled for 15 minutes and went about 35. Right. Um, I have been stopped on the streets through the remainder of the weekend by many people who saw the film and said they were very touched and moved and they learned something, which well, so I think the reaction has been very favorable. It's, a, it's an emotionally gut-wrenching film. Mm -hmm. uh, most people are brought to tears th through different moments of the film. Um, and it really highlights the silent social tragedy that um, mo the most common reaction is, I, I knew nothing about this. 
and you, neither did I when five you have, or six years ago. When you have stories that, uh, any, any story that, that centers on children, I mean, right. it, it's, how, how uh, the hardest hearts would be the only ones that would not give ear to uh, to a story dealing with children, right? Well, but with this with this uh, issue uh, that is brought up in Stuck, what would what would you say? What 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 is the opposing regulations that you uh, would like to see deregulated okay. by the State Department? Well, by all governments. I, I'd like everybody to come together and let's examine this process. The current process today, uh, the average intercountry adoption takes thirty three months cost $28,000. Um, today we are, and most of the systems are done manually, and, and in many instances there are way too many components of this system that are just revenue generators. I want to be clear, we're not advocating for a, a reckless or sloppy system. We're, rec we're, we're advocating for a more efficient system that promotes greater safeguards that has greater transparency, but is done more efficiently. Our what if is what if we could design a new system that had greater safeguards, greater transparency. We never put a birth mother at risk, never put a child at risk, but instead of 33 months, it takes eight months. And instead of $28,000, it takes costs $7,000. How many more kids do you think would find their way into a family? The answer is a lot. And uh, what we, we, we used to have to start looking at this in mm -hmm. entrepreneurial terms, not in bureaucratic terms. Mm -hmm. um, and if we could get, if this film can create this movement, and then we can get the, uh, the world's attention, I believe we can get enough bright and, uh, and intelligent people in the same room to find a new way. Let's just challenge the current expectation and look for a better way. And um, if we come together with a can-do attitude, we can solve this problem. Um, the, pro the issue today is, is that it's been convenient and easy for us to, to kind of look the other way and forget about these kids because they're tucked away in far off corners of the world, places you and I have probably not been to, yeah. and they're low on the totem pole. And the whole point of the film is to, to elevate these kids' lives and make this a relevant social issue. Um, these kids' lives matter, and we should be defending the right of every child to belong in a family, not just the rights of the children who are contained within our borders or somebody else's borders. Um, there are, uh, there is a vast amount of untapped human potential living in these orphanages today. And when you go into these orphanages, what you see is this eclipse of human potential because these kids have nothing to do. They just rot away till they're 14 years of age and then they go out on the streets ill prepared to be productive members of society. Why do you think that the standing policy is in place and what what validates in your opinion it being that way right now well if you look at the UN rights of a child the, and and even UNICEF's position UNICEF really believes that a child is better off in their country of origin to preserve national heritage than they are being in a family in another country um, the very first time I heard that position with a, in my first meeting with UNICEF years ago, I was astounded by that position because right up the street from UNICEF is a place called Ellis Island. And our country is great because we embrace diversity and we've welcomed people. We all came from somewhere, right? And, um, but their position is, is they would really prefer to see a child stay in country. And years ago, UNICEF used to say, inter-country adoption is the last resort. Uh, for the child. And I think the first resort for a child is to get that child into a loving and protective family so they can grow up to become who they're supposed to be. Not living in these institutions where they're, they're trapped and confined and suppressed. So, Do you know what the statistic of adoptable children are in America right now? That, uh, domestically? Don't, that don't, yes, well, domestically. Well I know, in the, you know, mm -hmm. there's Hundreds of Because that would be the argument on the opposing side, probably. Well, I think that Always. what we're hoping Stuck does is just yeah. promote this whole idea that every child deserves to belong in a family, and all boats will rise. Right. So, in country adoption in foreign countries and in our country will elevate. Um, uh, we're foster care will elevate. Family reunification will become more prevalent. Um, we're we are not uh, zealots for adoption. We are advocates for a child's right to belong in a family. Mm -hmm. Stuck is an interesting piece because the, the theme of the story is really 
a child's right to belong in a family. But the, the storyline is the broken system of in, international adoption. Foster care has some deficiencies. Domestic adoption has its deficiencies. All of these processes today are problematic, and we're hoping that this, this film will create a conversation to begin to address all of these issues. Mm -hmm. Once again, right at the very beginning of our, of our interview here, when it comes to children, I mean, it, it's such a difficult uh, subject matter to split in two, you know, to side 100% on your side, and I'm sure on the opposing side, they have uh, just as many rational points of view mm -hmm. that support their uh, perspective on this, on this matter. But then once again, it's all about the child. And of course, anybody with a heart is going to look for the best uh, possibility for a child's life. This well, is a very difficult, very difficult, as you probably know already, av having uh, been an advocate right. for your cause. It's a very difficult uh, dis uh, decision. Well, I don't know if it is. I don't know if it is that difficult. I think it's. I think it's binary and obvious. If you look at it in these terms, uh, we have to. We have a choice. We can allow children to grow up in institutions or we can find a way to get them into a family. What, what do you think is the better alternative for a child? If we really are looking at it, the best interest of a child, this is a no-brainer. But however today, I really believe um, uh, we aren't putting the best interest of the child in front. I, I, I think my argument that I just gave you is irrefutable. I, I don't think there's anybody that's gonna say a child is better off in an institution. So what, what steps do you see uh, that is going to help deregulate the standing policies right now. What what needs to happen well, I think in our in our government in order to ensure the vision that you have and well, your organization have right. to come to be? I think this the, uh, the the our government has to take the lead, but we also have to get a we have to get a global response here. This is not a U.S. issue or just one country issue. This is a global issue, and. Um, we uh, have been able to do some things globally as a community, environmentally, um, in, in some other issues. Uh, we haven't been able to address the child welfare issue globally very well right now. And um, so I think the first step is to find a way to make this issue important enough to, de to, to, to make sure that the world's leaders are devoting some mind share to it. That's what, that's what we're hoping the film does. Once we think we've established that as our beachhead, then we can go in and start looking at functionality. What are best practices today? What are best opportunities for improvement? Let's go create some pilot programs. Let's really start to look at utilizing modern technology. Mm -hmm. You know, in the area of civil registry, there's, it's been estimated that there are 200 million children in the world today that we don't know exist. I mean, we don't have any record of them that we know they exist, but we don't have any formal record. So what if we just could start to create a global, uniform platform of civil registry with solar powered kiosks in various villages across the world and create a uniform database and start to create this civil registry program so we know who these kids are. At the heart of the matter of the process, is, is of adoption of the adoption process is this thing called eligibility. Is the child eligible, really an orphan, and is the family legitimately eligible to create a loving and nurturing environment for this, these children? I don't think it should take 33 months to to make that determination. And um, today, what happens is the child and the family get matched, and then we start to determine eligibility. I think what we should do is pre-authorize uh, 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 people, you know, or, or uh, pre-approve people. So let's determine eligibility first and then match people, and then I think the process can go much more uh, efficiently. And I think that's a big way we can, re we can reduce time, which is the most important variable for the child. By the way, every day matters in the developmental cycle of the child. What would you say for the people that are supportive of the standing regulations right now with adoption, what would you say is their main concern of this push that's coming from uh, your side 
What is their main concern? What are they What are they concerned about? In your In your opinion, national sovereignty, or probably, or or the fact that you know, I think there's a lot of cultural ego involved here. That uh, some of these countries feel that if we were to promote adoption in our country, was that there is a. Uh, that they're admitting that they can't take care of their kids, and um, so you believe it's it's not so much an American problem in that area, but internationally, other countries of how they're going to be perceived as a nation. Right. And by the way, there most people don't know this, but last year there were 85 American children adopted abroad. And I think over time, if inter-country adoption became a prevalent activity, you know, and you're looking 30, 40, 50 years from now, and we really did have this cross-pollination of heritage and race, and we really did create a global society, I mean, I think the, the terms of uh, discrimination and, and, and race, and I think those those things would, uh, prejudice would become terms in a history book. I mean, today we always talk about, well, we've got a global society. We don't have a global, we have global commerce today. But intercountry adoption, I mean, if, even if you look at the microcosm of our experience in Scottsdale, where our three children came in from Haiti, um, there's a, a, a much greater awareness about Haiti today because of our three children's involvement in the community. And I think that's healthy. I think we should open our eyes to other parts of the world, and we shouldn't be living in a in a segregated funnel. I think we should be open to all kinds of cultures and all kinds of heritages and all kinds of experiences. Um, and I think this again. I think this 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 cross pollination of heritages is is only an asset. Today, there are many organizations who see that as a liability. Greg. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to go to our site? To share? Go to, please go to our site, uh, bothendsburning.org. Sign our petition. Become a member. Wear the wristband that uh, says every child has the right to belong in a family. Um, we need support. This uh, changing the world is not a one-person job. And. Um, but what we have seen historically is that when uh, you can mobilize enough people and, and get one big collective voice, things change. And we're trying to replicate some great other success organizations that we that have inspired us to get us to this point. Um, but we need help, and we need uh, we need uh, uh, as many people on this bandwagon as possible. So please go to our site, sign our petition, and get involved with us. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Be back.